All right, so what we're going to have on menu tonight is multiple things. So last week, uh, the setup or the syllabus said role of regulatory sector decision makers and stakeholders. Yeah. Today, we have on the menu urban economics and dynamic growth models, real estate types, and uses. We have not done our usual suspects when it comes to land use decisions with the Supreme, US Supreme Court. So we're going through the Nolan, Dolan, Lucas, and Kilo versus New London. Yeah. Um, the first three are fairly fast, um, they're easy to look up. The other one, I want to put a little bit more emphasis on the social component um, when we talk about takings. Yeah? What well, do, because this is stuff that is in one textbook, then in the provided copies at the library. Um, the Kaplan readings, by the way, chapter 13, is a different summary and storytelling than actually the textbook. I like the Kaplan chapter better. So the most sus uh, usual suspects we are having here, the solving explanations, issues of takings, are in that one chapter, really nicely. If you haven't done the readings for last week, focus on chapter 13, on that uh, Kaplan reading. Uh, copies. Yeah? So for next week, which is the last session before the exam, we also have, yeah, it's next week. No, next, week's the one. Oh, that, next week is the last session. Then you have seven more nights, then you write an exam. Yeah, the last week, the exam is October 10th. If I recall the schedule right, we're going to meet here at six o'clock, we have two hours time. Yeah? And the exam, we're going to post a study guide. Next week is majority of next, about a third of next week is going to be a review. Now, just to get things we had like last week and even things we had like in the very beginning, there's one element we have to pull back in. Now, to get the larger overview, the macro view on how all of this fits together when we talk about real estate principles, law, and the like examples. Uh, so next week we're going in a typical real estate types again, we're touching depending on time, office space today, but office more in a mathematical numbers. So I try to mix this with examples and if there are certain calculations for markets. Yeah? That's one goal. We are going to start reviewing the land use planning law and all the regulations from last week just to have that really in you know, time on file that you really can repeat this and listening to that one more time. It's a different way of learning than reading it in a book. Oh yeah, PDR, oh okay, two paragraphs. Oh okay, fine, I got this. Versus, hey, what is actually PDR in your own words? Yeah? Uh, we're doing this in the beginning. Then I go into the usual suspects. I try to make this as interactive and fun as possible. Even if it's law, I'm sorry. Um, and the world famous takings case, Kilo versus New London, I actually have a few slides, but also video material. It's a decision in 2005. There have been multiple um, reports written and stories and case studies written. And I'm going to follow us to two or three little videos I find the most prominent in explaining the, the social context. As I keep telling you guys, it's about telling the story. You know, whenever you have a chance to take a look at the other classes I teach uh, on the videos on our YouTube channel, then it's all about telling a story. How much money are you going to make with this project? A million. Or, well, with this project, we are going to introduce a very vibrant mixed-use development to the neighborhood, we believe that there have been not enough retail components satisfying the market, and by the way, we're going to make a million. The other one, the second one, is a little bit more on the story, yeah? versus the finance to the point. Yeah? Depending on your audience, that differs. Right. So, again, I am not a legal professional. I'm going to introduce these zoning cases, or taking cases, 
with a lot of enthusiasm as I have them experienced through my own education practice as a planner and as a real estate professor. Yeah? So if there's something wrong, Mr. Freelaw, raise your hand. More than happy to be, ch uh, be challenged and saying, hey, we've got to put this in a different perspective. This is a fun class for me. This is tonight you probably will see why I actually dropped business administration and went to economic geography and then went actually into real estate at the end. Uh, turned over my elements. Found marketing completely boring. Found this way more exciting. So if I talk too fast, raise your hand, hold me down. Uh, really spend most afternoon to get all the enthusiasm out and make it really, really boring. Uh, I'm still excited. Um, got double sets of color. All right, not in my backyard. Something to remember here. Yeah? Not in my backyard, NIMBYism as in unwanted users of existing residents. Huh? The most powerful example is we live in a small little community and a power plant, power plant is to be built behind your house. Not in my backyard. There are Supreme Court cases about the not in my backyard. Anything you can imagine has been brought forward in a lawsuit because people found that they have been infringed in their private property rights or in the well-being or full enjoyment of their property. Yeah? That word full enjoyment came back, have to slide back again, was <coughs> part of the chicken coop case, remember? US military versus uh, Cosby because he was not unable to fully enjoy his property and the amenities given to the property. Okay. If we talk about constitutional, constitutional principles, <coughs> this whole thing we talk about, the last hundred years of lawsuits, is built on two amendments, number five and number 14. Yeah? One is the due process, and the other part is the taking of property, the Fifth Amendment. Yeah? That is the basis for all the craziness you can observe when it comes to urban planning and real estate development. This is as layman's words I can put on this. Yeah? It's a challenging but a fun opportunity to deal with this. We're going to take care of eminent domain today and public use. Yeah? Again, remember, there are two different processes. They are built on these two different setups. Therefore, we can't put them in mind, as in when we talk about land use cases, that we can present certain questions. Does the regulation make sense in the public context? This is what we're going to have a discussion here. All evening long, is it about the public needs for health, safety and welfare. We're also <coughs> going to talk about, when we talk about takings, does it have a necessity, justification, yeah, for that action? Does the regulation reflect a response to public needs for health, safety and welfare? Yeah. If you have a huge trash pile in the middle of the road, yeah, people just throwing their trash on the, the middle of the street and no trash pickup comes. Duh, safety and health is definitely an issue. Uh, that's the reason why the city comes out and cleans this up. Uh, which is a side, fun side effect. Um, you ever heard about a thing called May Day? Electronic music people in the room? In the room here? Never heard about a thing in Berlin called May Day? Festival. A festival, a music festival? Okay, yeah. It's like ultra, way more cooler. Yeah. <laughs> um, they actually had some issues with this, health, safety, and welfare, because it started out as a political announcement, like a rally, yeah? actually literally to rescue a radio station, turned into a million people attendance uh, carnival with floats and lily. DJ after DJ on a big truck floating and people dancing for days. Yeah? 
but the city of Berlin had actually the problem to clean up the trash because it was a free festival, no charge, nothing, you know, the particular parade. So they ended up actually in saying that this is for these health, safety, and welfare purposes. It is questionable if this would be a political statement, therefore in public needs uh, rally, and then actually ended up and suggesting, hey, you actually have to pay for the cleanup. And therefore the May Day moved from Berlin, capital city in Germany, to one of the outer skirt cities in West Germany, uh, Düsseldorf or somewhere right now. That's still a great festival, uh, but different setup. They're more now indoors rather than big food change over 10, 15 years of elements. Uh, <coughs> I just, in that context, just, just wait until Ultra gets into trouble with that. Nuisance, sound, traffic is definitely high already on this. So you can see, even an electronic music festival can be used as an example here to deal with this kind of issues when it comes to the due process of regulations. Ah, again. Keep this in mind, 14 and 5 are the powers where policing and therefore the governmental control of zoning comes from, or is rooted in. Zoning background. Power to zone. Quick thing again. Well, Professor? Yeah? I think we may have done these slides last year. That's a review. Well, these are the reviews. This is review. Oh. As in review. I know that we have done those. I know. I know. <laughs> no, I'm doing this for, with one purpose, so you have heard it twice. Hint, hint, comma, hint. Huh? But you also know that we had like four or five, I'm presenting just right now one. Yeah? I'm going to make this really short. Power of governmental authority to provide health, safety, and again, welfare. And we use this for taxation also. As a reminder, the right to the city, historically, taxation, residence, and to coin. Huh? That's the reason why I'm running through this, because we have done this already. I did. You should be able to tell me right now what's on this one. I can read exactly what you have. What do you have? What I have? Power from the city, constitutional status. Good. For statutes. I just tried to make sure that you have this. What else do we have in here? Uh, there is some issues. So, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Because I really want to, okay. Fine. You can review, I, not that you I just didn't know if you knew that, that's all. You can review this, absolutely. Oh, I know. I know that. This is, <laughs> I have a few. All right, let's chop a few on the basics. In case this question comes into the study guide, Paul wrote it for you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, this is the reason why I put this up. Uh, again, uh, some of the slides I'm more than happy to share. I usually don't do that, but there's short definitions that help to keep that in mind. Uh, again, this is not a law school uh, uh, a lecture, but it's trying to get the fundamentals into this classroom so you can keep it and have this fundamental understanding when you are working as property managers or real estate developers or in the vicinity of these realms, you, know, you understand planners are actually people, but they're really constrained with, by this law thing. Yeah? And the communication levels we are going to push here are based on this. Yeah? So when you talk about an R1 versus an R3 zoning restriction or ordinance, all of this is based in there. Yeah? All right. PUD, really cool element, to make this really short, I, kept, I t took out the map that showed the different elements, as in, I create my own zoning district. This is in short, what is the planned unit development district? Yeah? I create my own zoning district, which allows me to be flexible or more constrained in one or the other way. Yeah? Own zoning district within a city or a region. Then, and yeah, the next slide, look, you know the next slide too. Next slide is TDR. This is 
fundamental basics for increasing and shifting around of de development density. This is going to be really important when you're in rural areas where you want to have a certain amount of preservation. This is also going to be interesting here nowadays in Florida when it comes to wetlands, Everglades, coastal regions. Uh, and the pressure of development. Same thing here. Remember again there are differences in who is involved as parties. One is a public action which means not development for the preservation part and the other one is moving development rights as part of the trade. No? Development moratoria, again very quick flashing if you do the readings, hey, there are certain elements we had in class before. Now, as a reminder on what is the uh, legal framework we're going to deal with. All right. When I talk about tickets, we can look at this as one, the physical invasion of a property, put something on it, duh. Uh, if you have a uh, Walmart semi-trailer coming in and they park their semi-trailer in your park in driveway, it's probably a physical invasion, yeah? or even in your backyard, it's even more. Um, but also, most parts of the cases we have seen and will see tonight is what we could call the loss of beneficial use or the economic means of the property. When we talk about eminent domain, we have full, partial, or temporary takings when it comes to time frames. Did we have that example with the canal flooding? Yes. 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 It's a repeat. Yeah? It's a temporary, temporary taking. But in that specific case, Saganali, they pretty much said, no, it's not a taking because you still have partial economic means of your property. Yeah? So whenever you take a look at uh, cases and in the readings, check if there's a physical invasion in place or if the economic means of the property are jeopardized. All right, how that check as we repeat here again. Sorting out of an existing brickyard. Over time, the ordinance was adapted and changed, therefore they collided literally with the law. Yeah? Convi uh, convi convicted of a misdemeanor for the violation of city ordinance, but however, they had issues with annexation back then. Yeah? And as all those land use cases, they could not settle locally, they went up to the Supreme Court case. Yeah? And the regulation here was, it's not a taking because it's done in the public interest, but it still allows some productivity, productive use on the property. As in, we are sorry you can't burn any more bricks, but you still could use it for something else, like warehousing. Uh, and the problem here is now to tell the property owner what type of use could be beneficial. Same thing here in the assigned readings for tonight, the capital readings, Pennsylvania, Cole, Mahoon, Mahone is mentioned here again. And the idea again is to repeat this, that you deal with surface rights and coal mine rights underneath your property. When we talk about the full enjoyment of the amenities of your property, nowadays we also have to include what's underground and above the ground. Now in the Miami context with the formerly known Bright Light Station, they value their property for loan application with air rights. So that's a new thing to look for when, you look, when you're interested in the legal dis, uh, uh, elements. And this is so funny because of the chicken, yeah? Um, but they actually got harmed and uh, um, hurt. But again, full enjoyment and use of the land was impaired. Again, te what is takings? In relative definition, Takings can be defined as a physical invasion of property, personal property, or as 
the, in, impacting the means, economic means of the property. Uh, this is the temporal flooding. And I point out here the cases all the time, so if you're interested to dig deeper in the proper la property language, proper language of those cases, um, it's easier to look them up. All right. This is, I think, where we stopped last week. Yes. So, C of U. Or version of U. So this is an interesting case because it was in 1926. In 1910, the city of New York issued a very first zoning ordinance as in defining what is a lot size and building height ratios to the street width. Yeah? So if you're experiencing, uh, if you experience a guy from urban design or architecture, they sometimes do this loser sign, yeah? which is the street width versus building height. It's a very simple way to just take a look at, does this make sense? Yeah? So the city of New York defines this, but they did not necessarily say what can be used and built on the, the property or the lot itself. The case here with the village of Euclid versus Amber Realty involved a change in the village zoning ordinance that downzoned the plaintiff or the plaintiff's land from industrial to residential, which nowadays is not necessarily a down zoning. Huh? And the realty company actually argued that the restriction imposed a 75% loss on the value of its property and therefore a taking. And you can see, we've highlighted here as use, that have been different density steps on this property, like a little like a gradient going down in the slope. Huh? The Supreme Court upheld the ordinance as a permissible exercise of policing power. Again, number five, number 14. And decided that the Amber Realty Company did not lose all economic value of its property since the land could be still developed and sold by buying for less money than the original selling. Therefore, no takings occurred. Let that sink in. Let's assume I would be able to make $10 million with this property. Zoning changes, now I'm making $2 million of property. The $2 million profit on it. On it. Huh? I go through the US court system and end up with the Supreme Court decision. What do you mean? You're still making $2 million. You have not lost the economic means of the property. They have been diminished but you still have not lost all of them. In 1926, this did constitute a, not a taking at all. Huh? So this is complete taking, it's not considered a full taking, it's not considered a full No, back then, no. Huh? Very interesting component. The interesting component here was that the ruling favored the city on basically arguing that the diminished value is not a taking. Which is then interesting because you can see recently in the airport authority paid a lot of money to replace windows. Yeah? Because you could argue that if you have your house or property allocated in the airport abroad, same thing with the chickens, it would constitute a, uh, certainly a, a taking because you can't fully enjoy your property. Huh? So if I give you for free better windows, upgrade you to the highest standards in uh, hurricane protection and noise reduction, therefore you would be able now to increase the enjoyment of your property. I pay for it, you get balanced out. Yeah? There's an Italian mathematician, Pareto, um, who actually put that in theory, in mathematical theory. I call that the so-called Pareto principle. As in, if you have 
multiple parties involved. If I actually pay someone uh, some money for compensation, so, but everyone is still better off as a community, that's fine. Yeah? We're going to have a discussion on easements tonight. And sometimes easements are being paid off. As in, I will pay you for the use of your land, and even if it's just a, um, a power line. But where the power line is going to be, you can't put structure underneath it. Yeah? And I will pay you for the excess of your land, physically and non-physically. All right. So, what does actually Euclid, uh, the Euclid case actually means for us today? <coughs> if you look at this diagram, <coughs> you have multiple zones down here that are passing through this property. The legal context of this case defines or gives a recommendation then to actually use one zone only for a particular piece of land. Therefore we get now into the dimension of Euclidean zoning where after this court case, everything is based on one zone, one parcel of land, one property. Just to make sure that you don't have any changes in here. So we ran through the review. Do I have other zoning tools nowadays that will be able to change my existing zoning or, in, or influence my existing zoning? What if, if I want to change my density? Would I have certain tools to change my density in an existing zone? Yes, such as? Actually three. One, I could create an overlay zone, known typically, let's say, for historic preservation or noise control. Yeah? Mosquito abatements, where mosquitoes are going to be treated or not, is done with over the zone. Yeah, there's lawful text behind that mosquito abatement. Yeah? But here, if this is one large property, and I want to have different density in one corner or the other corner of the property, I could use a PDR to get more density on the side. Buy the development units or development units per acre from somewhere else and increase them. I also could create this as a planned unit development, PUD, and have my own zoning code, depending on the size of the property. If this is just half an acre, not really. If there's 20 acres, yeah, let's talk about it. Huh? So even though Euclidean zoning is one use per property, I can alternate these kind of interpretations depending on size and the communications I do with the government. It's more a flexible element right now, depending on the size of the property and your environment. If this is a pure residential neighborhood and everyone has like a 0.15 acre, you're really written in solid rock. Yeah? But if this is open for debate, Let's have a conversation. Again, this is the milestone of what I call the usual suspects of Supreme Court cases when it relates to zoning and real estate development. That's the milestone. Do I have anything in my notes here? Again, a short re repetition of that de loose trans uh, 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 definition. Takings is a physical invasion and loss of the beneficial use, aka economic means of the property. So we're going through a few of those examples now. They're in uh, a timeline, but easy to remember is Nolan Dolan Lucas, because it's kind of right. Nolan Dolan Lucas, a Lucas imagery. No? 
you can do any actually the exercise before that. So if we have thinkings defined on the prior slide, yeah, and we can justify it here on the bottom left as the power of a governmental authority to provide for health, safety, and welfare. As in, I have the government come in and tell who's going to Molly. They tell you, you can't do this on your property. We're going to do something with your property. We will take away something of your property because the public will be better off. We, in public interest, in a public good, we need to do this. You know? Versus 14th Amendment, no state shall make or, and you can read the rest, enforce any law which shall abide the privileges of immunities of citizens of the United States or shall blah, 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 life, liberty, and property without the process. You know? So, most of those takings cases will have an argument that at some point that process of the law was not done correctly. Yeah? That's one other thing to look at. Was the due process done the right way? All right, so the, race, the question to wake you guys up a little bit, we have a small discussion at first the teams and then we put those actually with many definitions or examples on the board, what is the public good? I'll give you about five minutes. You can huddle up two or three people in a team or more if you want to and have a discussion with yourself on what is the public good? If you never had that before, think about what is the public good. Do yourself a favor, don't Google it right now. Figure out what's, what's the definition of public good. Why don't you guys go together, uh, you in the front row, Alex if you don't mind, join them so we have four, four, and four. Huh? What is the public good? Be talking about private property, so what's the public good? In what, like in what sense? Is that well, that's something you can discuss. <laughs> context. Find it. What, what is the public good? It's like, okay, what's the context? Or well, we're talking about zoning and planning law right now. All right. We also had a discussion on health, safety, welfare. The next question then is, what's the public good? Could be also, what are public goods? I want you to have a discussion with your with you guys in the team, and then we have a discussion between the teams. So to make sure you guys are a little bit more dynamic than just listening for two hours or four hours of lectures. Fresh air would be an example, right? Write it down. Write it down. I'll have you guys talk about it then. Everyone, want to, each of the teams comes up and we write this down. It's like a, it's like a service that benefits everyone in society. We're trying to make a law based class a little more enthusiastic. Library should also library would be public goods. Schools, yeah. schools. Yeah. 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 They're sponsored by like state farms. State like, troopers? No, not the state troopers. They like drive around and help people with flat tires on 95 so they don't get run over. I forgot what they're called. Public safety. Road ranger? So who's financing the road ranger? I don't know if it's supposed to be examples more. So the road ranger or what it is. Um, yes, because if you're driving on 95, it's a public road that you don't have a public home. Oh, yeah. 
could be an argument. But think about a little bit more larger and smaller. Yeah, you should have your scale, you pay for registration on your vehicles, which pays for the road rangers. Well, not, not just larger scale in that, that example. Probably good. I like this idea about the uh, yeah. small schools, about small like the churches, street schools. Right now? Yeah, we can have a discussion Something that is non-excludable and non-revolutionary. 
Non-excludable and what? Non-ripple risk, meaning it can't be competed with. For example, like fresh air, you can't go somewhere else for an alternative for cheaper fresh air. Or better fresh air. Or better fresh air. Or all right, first of all, you know that I'm a scuba instructor. So air is a really nice, important good to have underwater. Yeah? My old microeconomics professor is using actually diamonds and air, well, passed away, but he used to use diamonds and air as a discussion about goods and pricing of goods. Yeah? Why would be the price of diamonds in the US more expensive or higher than let's say in Europe? Because they're Access. less common? No. Transportation. They're produced in South Africa. But why would you pay more for diamonds in America than actually in Europe? People are willing to. Huh? People are willing to. People are willing to. There's more demand. If you're getting engaged, there has to be rock on it. Huh? In Europe, you're getting engaged with metal, not with a rock necessarily. That's changed maybe, but old school wise. Yeah? So, air, it's free, isn't it? I can breathe it. Is the air in the room right now that you breathe free? Technically, yes. Technically, yes. However, to breathe the fresh, or rather fresh air in this room is associated with a cost. You can hear it. With paying electricity and the technology of air conditioning and air filtering to have a circulation in this room permanently to deal with this. Yeah? So, example again with free air. If you are at the beach, air is free. Yeah? Not necessarily quality, but air is free. If you're down at 100 foot, you your air is limited on the 80 cubic feet tank or something like this that you have on your back. So if you're running low on air at 100 feet, you're probably going to pay a lot of money if you would have that transaction to get another tank. Huh? Would you do that for a diamond? Probably not. The value of a diamond underwater is zero. First of all, you can't see it. But air is more important. So that's kind of a, what we call a price paradox on. You know? Depending on where you're at and what kind of situation you are in, price might be the price of a good might be different. But I like the fresh air part because what is the price we are willing to pay to maintain a specific quality of fresh air in nature versus in urban environment, aka, let's say, developed, developed country. Huge political and technology sector behind that. Yeah? Air filtering as an example, gas emissions as an example, air filtering for manufacturing. Yeah? How much millions of dollars do you actually pay for a wet filter system when literally you run the exhaust gas through a bathtub Let's make this very non-technical versus to just blow it out. Yeah? Example, just blowing it out could be a diesel truck you have on a construction site or a cruise ship versus your Prius. They have different filtering systems and energy concepts when it comes to the discussion, let's say, an intent of fresh air. Yeah, how huh? much the diesel trucks cost to keep running because of those filtration systems? Well, that's the other part, the other discussion when we talk about environmental economics. Yeah? Uh, just walk by the school where the school buses are idling to keep the, bu bu the bus code for the kids and you walk by the, the exhaust pipes. The argument of fresh air is <coughs> questionable. So what about something like, what about something like a smog check? Hmm? A smog check? A smog check? Like a smog ban? Like, yeah, like for cars, like to keep the air. Oh yeah, we have that all over your all over the countries. Not in Florida. Not in Florida. I mean, nation states, all the countries. Maybe California has a We don't. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are other examples you can present. But I say in certain summer times, certain regions in the, in the world tell you if your engine in the car is older than X years, 
with certain emissions output, you're not allowed to drive. Yeah? You're not allowed to enter an urban area unless you have a special tag for special purposes. Yeah? There are different concepts in this place that deal with the public good of fresh air. Yeah? I don't want to get into a crazy political discussion, but I think you get the flavor here that there are certain elements here on this board that are more or less heated in politics globally. Yeah? All right. First group here to my right. Give me a rundown. What do you mean with this? So non-excludable, um, meaning basically that you, and, well, sorry, non-excludable and non-rural meaning basically that you can't commercialize it, so to speak, where it's not, their goods where they promote health and welfare of okay. society, but you can't, let's like, say, have, create a monopoly of it or have a business or something. Like Let me challenge this. Fresh air, can I privatize, monopolize this? No. Or depends. I could. Depends on the environment. If it's a closed system like a building, I can have, depending on the what electrical, what kind of air conditioning system I put in, ventilation yeah, system. That's a choice to install those systems. You can be in hot air for free. True. But I could be the middleman to deliver that to you and make a price for that. Yeah, but the price is for cold air, not fresh air. It's You could go outside and breathe the fresh air. Oh, I like that argument. What about parks? Debatable, because on weekends they charge. State parks, though. State parks. OK, let's or have a discussion. Parks. Treasure, yeah. We have multiple different set of parks. We have federal and national parks. Yeah, they do a charge. They do a charge fee because that's part of the, how they maintain it. You have state parks where, depending on where you're at, you might have a charge fee to maintain that. Yeah. The question is whether it's for profit or not. True. If it's a private park, do you have an idea of a private park? Um, yeah. For example, say Gulfstream Park or. Yeah, no, that's an event space. I would go with an event space because that's uh, where the horse races are. Yeah. yeah, I would go with an event space. No, private parks, homeowner associations. If you live in a larger development, you could actually have park areas designated or playgrounds designated in that area. Uh, if it's a gated community where only residents have access to it, it's not anymore a public good. Well, it's a good of that community. But that's common case we pick here on, uh, once in a while is Hawks Landing as an example. Beautiful outside, beautiful on top. I haven't been there yet, full disclosure. I don't know if they have a park in there, but it's probably not accessible to the public as in let's go and play some frisbee golf. Yeah. Or you showing up at the gate and say, hey, I want to play in the park. Probably not. You sit in a town, super liberal with their um, parks and trails and all that, <coughs> highest quality of life I experienced. Once in a while, development, small little urban park style, not big, just a playground like this size of the, play, uh, the room. For the residents of XY development only. Like you would delib deliberately talk about a parking spot. You're driving by with a six year old or five year old at that time, it's like, why can't we go to this one? because we are not part of that uh, community, we are excluded. Yeah? All right, what do you mean with churches? Churches are public good? Interesting thought. Some, I hear from the other side. Any comments? I yeah, it's more of a political question, uh, question of, or not political. So, the right to worship is protected under the First Amendment. There's also the, uh, the, uh, the use of land to execute your right to worship. It's protected by the RLUPA, the Religious Land Use and Institutional Partners Act. Now, half the slides. Not planning on presenting it. There's a little bit of readings on, in the book, so you get the message. Uh, fun, fun pictures in there. So, 
our looper cases are interesting because an example, you have to write to the assembly for worship. Like the weekly prayers in a neighborhood, even if it's zoned as residential, you know, and not giving you a variance to have the use of the church in place, but you could, in theory, again, you can, based on these examples, you can start your own church in your garage. Huh? Or if you're a certain religious group, you can say, hey, we don't have a, a formal place for worshiping, we can meet and assemble at a private property and get there for protection. Yeah? Unless there's burden to the community. That's both, it works both ways. Uh, it's a tough topic. There is constitutional protection. Yeah? Um, but I have been blessed as a baptized as a Catholic that I have been in any potential thinkable religious place of worship, being invited and celebrated with friends. You know? But again, what he said in terms of ideology, there are certain religious groups that might not fit with each other. I'm not going to get examples, but there's a certain interpretation. And we're moving so, into a very thin eyes in an educational environment, and I don't want to touch that. Yeah? Um, but an interesting, very interesting thought. There's also, I can pull it out for you if you want that, um, an interesting article years ago in a journal of urban affairs written about places of worship and how they actually contribute to stabilizing the neighborhoods. Particularly if it's a small little community church in, let's say, in a retail area, empty retail space, and they put the church in there to actually meet, you know? And that gives a different perception of safety in the neighborhood. What about beaches? If you want there. Alright? We live in Florida, huh? I have the slides for that tonight. What is the eight House Bill 631 last year, 2008? You ever heard of House HB 631? No? Or what tonight? Doubtful. The interpretation of beaches being a public good is more and more in trouble. No? Because of personal, private uh, property. Park rangers, I like that. You guys explain uh, road rangers to me. Explain lighthouses. Uh, why? Can, how did you come up with lighthouses? Well, I, I came up with street lights, and I just kind of figured lighthouses. All right. Because I mean, they are a public good because they're there to help direct. It would kind of kind of be like uh, the airport tower too. They fall under the non part because you can't stop anyone from using a lighthouse. I don't really know how to no, 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 no. no. I like the way she's going with that. You put the lighthouse in place, and the lighthouse, what does it do? Like in the old days, it rotated with light. So it was a signaling, signaling function of hazard or landmarks, therefore for a ship, a destination, or to avoid, or guidance. So I like that. Uh, the tower example would be now the, the, the radio beacons. Yeah. yeah. So you in your airport approach, you have on your map, you know where you're at, and you have radio beacons. If you pick up on that signal, you know where you're at. Yeah? GPS and all the tracking software changed that a little bit. Do you think but a satellite would be a public good as well? <laughs> so the history of GPS is military used and got, got commercialized and then privatized. So um, it's like the microwave. Uh, oven it used to be microwave for military uh, uh, use, then for communications, and then they realized we can also crack eggs open and heat, heat uh, other things. Uh, no, no jokes. Um, don't do that. Don't put a raw egg in your microwave. Your mom is gonna be really angry with you. <laughs> I did that once. <laughs> Was fun. All right, really good uh, good points. I like the non-excludable. I let's go to the middle. Services that promote health, safety, and welfare to residents. Want to say something about that? Education. I'm, well, so I mean, obviously, you can have private and public education, right. so it's not necessarily 
public in that sense, but there is uh, not necessarily guaranteed, but there's a certain level of education that's required. Does health, does education feed into health, safety, or welfare? I would consider under welfare. Okay. What about health? It could be under health also, because just because what we learn in school could be just about to make you healthier. All right. <laughs> so we're going from education to dress collection. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you have in mind with fresh collection? Sanitary systems, yeah, okay. Sanitaries, then I guess hospitals is part of the health system. Uh, health health components. Yeah. Okay, law enforcement. Public roads, transportation. All right. Group number three, very structured. Any comments? Um, comments wise, no. It's kind of what's been going on in the past couple ones. For health, we just probably went a little more broader when we said CDC, TSA. That's ah. more of like a, na uh, a national, international thing. Why is the Transportation Safety or the Transportation Security Agency a health category? Uh, we'll see for the transportation because that also stops people from bringing in like foreign uh, objects such as foods, plants, uh, animals, things like that, that energy for systems. <laughs> just kidding. Um, all right. Here we go. Clean water. We have fresh air on one side, clean water. Is the public good? It's a human, right? So it definitely falls under a public good. All right. Are we doing it? We try our best in organized cities. We have uh, water systems. All right. Good. Okay, sorry for the poke. Okay. Got, to, got to poke a few things on this board. Um, clean water we have, sanitation committees, we that, do that with trash and sewer systems. Yeah? So the idea of build, re, building new things and then putting up a septic tank, it's not going to fly yeah? unless you have a grandfathered in septic tank. Yeah? There are actually, here in the city of Plantation, there are actually properties on septic systems still. Yeah? Amazing. Like the small little farmhouse you can find within the city. So they actually are not attached to a communal uh, sewer system. OK, um, let's go from the bottom. Offices, what's that? Town offices? Yeah, DMV. DMV. Yes, city OK, so it functions for this to serve the citizens. OK. Interesting. I agree with public parks and trails, welfare, safety. You got, got that covered. Talk to me about social security. Mm. That's mainly because of the, the financial support system later on after that, which could still be a public good. Do you that? Because we all pay for it. Yeah. Could be a public good. I like the definition you said, safety net. Mm. Who initiated social security? Close. The one president I had to make a portfolio was, was actually Nixon. He actually put this in place. Let me double check, double check it. But the way I remember this from my American politics class was Nixon. He actually formalized it. All right. So good exercise. So wait a minute. What is then the public interest? No, no, was that here? Yep. Sorry, wrong. Me was wrong. I need to look this up. I didn't mix it. He signed the Social Security Bill into law August 14th, 1935. Let me double check Nixon as my personal homework. But I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I don't teach you something wrong, particularly when it comes to American politics. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the public interest? What is the public interest? We don't have any bond from political science in here, are we? Yeah? No. What is the public interest? All right. 
lots of public interest for fresh air. Living. What's the public interest for churches? Right to worship. Religion, sense of community. What's the public interest in beaches? Enjoyment, quality of life. Enjoyment, quality of life. <coughs> okay. Alex, what's the public interest oh, in boy. education? Oh, you guys put it under health, safety, and welfare to residents. Quality of life. Yeah. So quality of life kind of sums up the idea of health, safety, and welfare. I would think to make this a little bit short, to poke you a little bit in the idea of what is the what is the public good or public goods versus the public interest. You also can say the public interest is the effort to maintain public goods at a specific level. If I have zero interest in fresh air, why would I care? If I don't have any interest in dealing with, where was it, water, clean water, why would I care? Huh? You can spin this more and more and more. You put up the CDC. You have different agencies that are there to maintain certain standards. Again, I don't want to politicize this. I want to give you an example. I want to think down the road with this. If you decide I want to maintain a certain standard for my community, you're defining and your vision, you set up pretty much a vision how livable your community is going to be in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Yeah? I want to be a healthy, sustainable, vibrant community for all ages, as an example. I will find this probably in a document called the Comprehensive Plan, or in a vision statement of my city. Yeah? Where it says, Fort Lauderdale wants to be this place. City of Town of David wants to be this place. Yeah? City of New York has different ideas than LA. The city of sustainability is in Brazil, Cochiba. If you meet people from Cochiba, it's like, oh, well, I heard about you guys with your bus stops and sustainability and how you collect water and all that. Yeah? Different approach on how they deal with the public good their own personal benefits and interests articulated into the public interest. I didn't bring the slides, I didn't want to pull them in in terms of public participation. What we just had on, because there are different ideas and different thoughts, and I don't want to wander off too much away from real estate principles. Public interest. We had last Friday thousands and thousands of teenagers worldwide being on the street protesting and arguing about public interest is not taking care for valuable things that are public good. Yeah? So you can argue, well, depending on where you live, what you do, what kind of stage of life you're in, you have different interests and therefore you represent that into a form of public interest. Yeah? That's why people vote. That's why you support certain fractions of political ideas or support with your donations, let's say marine protection ideas, coral, yeah? simple thing, let's make this up. So it's completely outside of this classroom. In, for, in protecting marine life and coral reefs, your choice on which type of sunscreen you use will have different impacts on coastal regions. It's not a very new thing that what you put on your skin washes off in the ocean, but recent scientific uh, research showed that it has some impact on coastal regions, the coral reefs. You know? So therefore, some organizations will then re recommend use environmental safe sunscreen. Yeah. 
move away from is that sunscreen protection causing my skin to turn, to turn into a cancer versus what's the impact on the ecological system, the ecosystem outside. Uh, extremely outside of the classroom case. You will see that more and more because we are in Florida. We have a university that puts students into the ocean as a classroom. Uh, so we've got to think about that. I have the environmentally friendly sunscreen on every email I send out and things you should bring when you go diving with the school here. Just change step by step a little bit the idea of consciousness. Uh, and therefore, the public interest. Public interest in terms of straw, paper straw versus plastic straw, changed. Seattle started, Fort Lauderdale is implementing it by next year, I think, or in two years. Where they actually literally had an agreement that are saying we're getting rid of plastic straws because of environmental impacts and the trash. Huh? So, the public interest in this case would be trash reduction and environmental impacts. This is as much as I want to go with this because, again, it can highly get politicized. But I hope you have enjoyed that exercise in thinking about hey, what's the public good? So, who's paying for the public good? Public. Is all public the same? Why not? Depends where you are and? Political division of government. As in Paul pointed out, we had this repeat as a slide. Different forms of government? Uh. Exactly. Yeah? And the different forms of government, <laughs> in particular the power to sown, are based on what? Statues. 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 On which two principles? On a co two constitutional principles rooted in? Five and fourteen. Oh, the amendments. <laughs> ah, amendments. Yes. All right, I want to take a quick break. Sure. Let's do five minutes. <laughs>